know Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here is your host, Reverend Jeff Peterson. Well, last time and today, this week, we're focusing on the fullness of time. So maybe I just entitle this The Fullness of Time Part 2. And I get all excited about this because I like to just get right down to the very basics, down to the very rudimentary foundation of what it is that we believe. Where did it all start? How, you know, how did all of this get built up to where we have the church today? The church throughout the world, where all people, where all people can be part of it this day. And so I'm going to read once again from Galatians chapter 4, or excuse me, Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 26 all the way down to Galatians chapter 4, uh, verse 7. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no, lo no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, you sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Okay, so you have slaves and free. Male and female, Jews and Gentiles. But now the plain has been made even, that everybody is equal in the eyes of God. And that to have this happening in society and life, well, that's not the model for which God has given. That's not God's purpose or intention. So, for instance, if we're living in a land where you've got slave owners and slaves, and somehow in your mind thinking that this is right, understand that that right does not come from God. Matter of fact, God condemns this understanding because he doesn't have slaves anymore. But everybody is now a children of God. And as we you know, look at the Old Testament, as we look at, you know, it's pretty much set up that we, well, to fulfill the laws. But what the law is good. The law is very good. The laws of God. So what do we mean by the laws of God? Well, there's lots of laws of God, but most specifically, the Ten Commandments. Let's just take the Ten Commandments. And they say, oh yeah, I can follow those. And hopefully, for the most part, you know that we can follow those laws. And for the most part, that our whole society has adopted these laws, saying that, yes, we're thankful that God has given to us these basic laws, these basic principles of life, to create order in our society. I mean, after all, God created all things and has created order. You know, as far as creation goes, when we look at all the laws of physics, how thankful we are for them. But also the social laws that are very basic to life. That God is expecting all of humanity to follow that, that he's created us for worship. And so we know who we worship and whose name that we honor in this world and life. That we honor our parents and other people in authority. That we do not steal. 
that we do not kill, that we are not out uh, fornicating ourselves or committing adultery or any other sexual sins. That we're not out speaking falsely about our neighbors and spreading rumors about them. And then, of course, we're not to be coveting what belongs to our neighbor because we know that greed just ends up in, in all kinds of destructive conduct. And we, you're all saying, well, yeah, duh, this is very simple. Basic rules of life that every culture would be you know, certainly wanting to, to instill as their standard something that we live by. But yet we find ourselves breaking these things, even with our greatest intentions. You know, the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 7, you know, he's just talking about the tension of being both a, a saint and a sinner, a freed person of God, but yet where we continue to have to live in this world and our flesh and, and you know, just that tension that is there. But that's where he says, don't give up. You just continue on. And in those times when we stumble and fall, and of course John talks about this in 1 John chapter 1, that, that yeah, we're not to sin, but if we do, that we are to confess our sins. And God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But even though sometimes we are just so burdened down with our guilt, that we begin to think that God doesn't love us, we begin to think that, well, we just, we, we, we just don't think very highly of ourselves. We become depressed, despondent spiritually. And that's not how God wants us to be. But that we live and bask in his love and his grace, knowing that we are forgiven, meaning that he has taken us. Because what ends up happening is that as we fall, we say, well, I'm going to try harder next time. I'm going to prove to God, I'm going to undo what I did and show that I can be, you know, this real good uh, child of yours, dear God, and I'm going to own it up to you and show you that I can do better. And, and then in all of our efforts to try to do better, as we keep climbing up the ladder, that we find ourselves, oh, just when I thought I was <laughs> mastering this whole thing of following the law, now I found myself falling all the way down. I'm back to square one. And you know how defeating that is? We just think, oh, I'm worthless. I can't do a thing. You know, God, I got up one rung, then two rungs, and three rungs, and I was kind of looking for everybody below me to start applauding like you're doing so well. And then all of a sudden I slipped, <laughs> and I fell, and here I am lying flat on my back, Well, you know what? As we look up, guess who we see? We see Jesus. He says, I forgive you. Take my hand. And you are a child of God, but not based on following all these rules or based on your behavior or in relationship to the law because you can't fulfill it. Only Jesus can. And so in his death and his resurrection, that's where we are set free. That's where we live our lives in him. And what gives us the impetus to be able to live as children of God is that the Holy Spirit dwells within us, that we can cry out, Abba, Father. And so as we go through time, we see that there is be, being more and more a melding of people and cultures and backgrounds. And that's where we look at the United States as being a melding or what we call a, a melting pot of so many different cultures, so many different lands, so many different religions. And that does create problems from time to time because sometimes we, th we find that another group of people and their ideals and some of the cultural things as far as the basis that they pose a threat to our way of life and the way that we believe and the way that we think. And so you look at the early church and the world that they were living in is that there were basically two worlds that kind of butted up with each other there. And one would be 
the world of, of the Jews, you know, in, in Israel, in Jerusalem. And then you had the world of, of Rome, the Roman Empire that was, uh, and they just constantly lived in this tension. And so what does God do about this? <laughs> but that God sent a Savior that is going to fulfill both people. Here again, the Jews, they were people who, well, they had their law, they had their Old Testament, and Jesus came and has fulfilled that. And so when we look at the Old Testament, we certainly see where, well, you got the story of Abraham and, and Sarah, the story of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Jacob's sons, you know, they then become, well, their children then become, you know, the 12, Jacob had his 12 sons, and then the, all their, then as they got married and had their descendants, they became the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, they were slaves in Egypt. God freed them, and so you have the whole wilderness time. God is molding and making them into this nation again, and you're no longer slaves in Egypt, but now you are my children who I'm molding and making. And I've got the promised land all ready for you to go in. And not just so much to say, well, we have <laughs> discovered it, but they were going to go in and conquer it. And so that then led to the whole period of the judges. And from there, then the whole period of the kings. But in, in a, along with all of that, then you had... You know, God giving to Moses the, the laws, and lots of miracles took place. You know, like Moses freeing, or excuse yeah, Moses freeing God's people from, from slavery. You remember the big act of God where he parted the Red Sea? And during the time of the kings, I mean, there's amazing things happening all the time. And so throughout the whole Old Testament, we are just getting all those really wonderful stories of how God was with them and how God did amazing things to not only save them but preserve their life and to sustain them during, you know, as they did enter into the promised land. But we could see that as they tried to fulfill the laws of God that they always fell short. They always ended up succumbing to worshiping false gods and rebelling and disobeying the laws of God. And so they needed a savior. But then you also, in the midst of all this, you also had um, the prophecies. The prophecies. And that all of this, the laws, the prophecies, all these stories are all, you know, the stories are all prototypes of what is to come in Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And so when Jesus was born, as Jesus lived, as Jesus suffered and died on a cross and has arisen, that Jesus fulfills the Jewish scriptures and fulfills all of what he promised in Abraham and Sarah, saying that I'm going to give to you a seed, a seed being singular, and right away you think, well, that son is Isaac, but really the blessing is in the seed that he's given to all the people is Jesus, the Savior, who is the firstborn, Jesus being born without sin. Okay, well, now we'll shift gears. Getting back to the historian. Tertullian, who said, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Well, I just explained how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament and the Jewish traditions, but now we are focusing in on the, the Greek, the Greco people, Athens. And how <clears throat> we think about how Athens was the center of philosophy, of the philosophers. Mars Hill, and you got all of the altars to all the different gods. And, and so it's always so very interesting. And when we study about Athens and, and Jerusalem, that Jerusalem was definitely the, the capital for Israel. The Jewish people, that's where the temple was. And like I mentioned, like Mars Hill and, and Athens were, it was the philosophical center. And that's where, 
I'm not going to read it, but in Acts chapter 17, uh, verses 16 uh, through 34, that this is where the Apostle Paul came in there and was able to minister to them. You know, as they had an altar to the unknown God. Because in their philosophy, they had this you know, polytheistic understanding of God, and they had a God for everything and anything, and they were afraid that well, we, didn't, we don't want to miss a God, we don't want to offend a God. And so they had, they had an altar to the unknown God. And that was the Apostle Paul's in. To say, hey, I can tell you about the unknown God. The God who is veiled. The God that we cannot see has now made himself incarnate to us. He's the word that has become flesh. And that one is Jesus, and he is your Savior. And so as we look at, okay, so I kind of talked about the Old Testament and how we kind of went through the different eras of the Old Testament. Well, you can kind of do that with uh, the Greek philosophy as well. And I'm not going to go away to the very beginning, but one of the great philosophers was Plato. And when we think about Plato, you know, he, a big part of his philosophy had to do with concepts, forms. You know, there's this concept meaning that there's this form out there. It's outside of us, but it is there. And that we will live in this form. Or that we are creations of this form. In other words, the Logos, being God, has created uh, this form, this image, for which we now live. And that there's cause and effect. that, That for every effect, that means that there's a cause out there somewhere. And if there's a cause, that means that you're going to have an effect. And so to go and talk about creation as an atheist, well, then you can't call it creation because creation is the effect of a cause, meaning God. And so if you ask out God, then then what do you call creation? But just to talk about creation means that that implies that there's a creator. And, and so do you see where we now live in the image of that form? I mean, everything, just look around. Everything that you see, everything that, that you have is an effect. Everything has been created by something or someone. In other words, things just don't appear. But that everything has a basis. That there is a designer and that there is a builder. And so for me to say that the television sets that you're looking at right now, well, that just kind of is something that evolved over the course of millions of years. There's no intelligence that's gone into your television or any other of the technological things that you have. And there was no builder. And you're kind of looking at me like, huh? Duh. I mean, you're not convincing me. Well, creation is far more complex than the television that you're looking at. Far more complex than the computer that you use. Or the automobile that you drive. Or the toaster that you use to make your toast with. Whatever it is, just think about it. Everything that you use in a day, turning on your oven. And ask yourself, did this have a creator? Did, this, did somebody design this? Did somebody build it? I know the pastor on that program, To Know Christ, is saying that there is, but I, I question whether or not there was any intelligent design that went into the stove that I've turned on and just burned my finger on. Intelligent people don't think this way. 
You know, there's got to be a more sophisticated thing than having some human to, to give the credit to some human. Okay, so what am I getting at? I could go on and on all day long, kind of being facetious about the whole thing. But that was Plato's understanding. Is that what Plato would say is that, yes, somebody designed and built your television. It just didn't happen. And so it is with everything. And so when we think about, as we read in Revelation uh, chapter 21, verses 1 and 2, then I saw a new, a new heaven and a new earth come down. For the former has passed away. And then I saw the new Jerusalem. In other words, saying that this is all in heaven. This is Platonic thought. But now it has come to be. What has been the form, what has been the concept outside of us has now come to be. That the church has been established in this world, in this earth. You, have, you are in the image of God, that you are created from the form of God. And so that's where I want to talk about Jesus, because it was Paul who went to the Greek people, to the Gentile world, bringing people to salvation. And when you read about the Apostle Paul, yeah, there are some places like in Romans chapter 4, where he talks about Abraham and Sarah, but for the most part, you're not getting a whole lot of Old Testament background in this. What you're getting is a lot of philosophical thought because that's who he's writing to. He's writing to people who are living in the Greco-Roman, the Gentile world. And so I'm going to read a theological statement from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So do you see <laughs> the Greek philosophical thought in all of this? Jesus being in the form of God. Did not count equality with God, but rather... He humbled himself and became a servant who suffered and died on the cross. But now he's been exalted, you know, going back into the form of God that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he, that Jesus is Lord. And so I want you to see that, that the Apostle Paul has this philosophical, or excuse me, this theological statement that has to be philosophical in nature for the people to understand. Whereas the other one is Peter. Peter is ministering to the Jewish people. And so as we read 1 Peter and 2 Peter, so he's writing from, from an Old Testament background. He is showing how all of this has been fulfilled. And so when you read Paul's letters, it's got a philosophical background. When you read Peter and James's letters and Hebrews, it's got an Old Testament scripture background. And so I'm going to point that out here in uh, 1 uh, Peter uh, chapter 2. And uh, beginning with uh, verse 20, uh, 20 through, yeah, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 25. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for, for doing a good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. 
To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in our body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. Peter's message is pretty much the same as Paul's message, except that they are speaking to different people. Paul is speaking to the Gentiles. Peter is speaking and writing to the the Jewish people. Paul uses a philosophical understanding and a background, whereas Peter is using the Old Testament scripture. And he really is focusing in on Isaiah chapter 53, which talks about the suffering servant. And so that shows, yeah, and read Isaiah chapter 53. If you want to have somebody who is speaking over 700 years before Jesus came give you such a prophecy of how when the Messiah comes, that he will be the suffering servant and how he will suffer And die on a tree, die on a cross for us. And so Peter is showing that Jesus has fulfilled that prophecy. That he has suffered that pain. And so both Peter and Paul are saying, well, as Christians, as followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, that whether you come from a Gentile background or a Jewish background, that Jesus has called us, that we come together, that there's that melding in Jesus, that there's no longer slave nor free, male or female, Jew or Gentile, but that we are one in Christ and that we've been filled by the Holy Spirit and that we are all children of God this day. And so that's where we celebrate one with each other, that in Jesus Christ, who died on a cross and who's arisen from the dead, has given to us this great inheritance. You have been watching To Know Christ with Reverend Jeff Peterson pastor of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. For a donation of $15 or more, you can receive a copy of Pastor Peterson's latest book, Prayer, a practical guide to getting God's direction. Thank you for watching and tune in again next week for To Know Christ.